from, from the uh, he's an archaeologist at the Norwegian Institute of Cultural Heritage Research. Uh, Yuri Gwenik, uh, is a geologist at Norwegian Geological Survey. And uh, Flores Borgard from the town uh, BB uh, in, uh, in Holland. So, uh, now uh, um, Roy will tell us about the history of uh, Brygge and the historical background for this becoming a World Heritage Site. And then Guri will tell you the tactical thing about this walk and guide, guide it to. So, Roy, please. Is it working? Yes. Yeah, it is. I uh, hope you've all been enjoying a pleasant and informative conference. Um, yes, I've been working uh, with archaeological uh, excavations. That's what my institute is uh, involved in. Um, since yeah, I came here in 1980, so it's a long uh, a long history for me now. Um, I just thought I would uh, try to give you some background so that you can better understand why it is so vital to uh, safeguard the World Heritage Site of uh, Brigham. Sorry, water, that's what it's all about. <laughs> Yeah, the World Heritage Site is this uh, collection of buildings here. And we're sitting in this, which is the hotel that was erected from about 1980 onwards. Um, there's uh, about 61 buildings here, timber buildings, uh, most, mostly timber buildings. At the back, there are more stone buildings, stone cellars, as they call them. Uh, some of them dating back to, to medieval times. So, a bit of uh, topographic information. Yep. Sorry, fat finger syndrome. Ah. <laughs> uh, this is the World Heritage Site. This shows the original or shoreline, or at least the, the shoreline when the town emerged. The town was founded, according to historical sources, in uh, 1070 by the king at the time, Olaf Schure. Um, and it's generally accepted that this, the northern end of, of Brücken, this area here, is where the earliest settlement uh, originated, or where, where it was founded. But there are some other possible candidates as well, up by this lagoon here and maybe as well down by the, uh, the southern part of, of Britain. But we don't have any uh, excavations that, that show us that there are other uh, potential candidates for the, uh, for the earliest uh, settlement. Not yet, uh, maybe it will come up in the years to come. Next one is, uh, this is the, what they call the, the scheduled area of medieval Bergen. This is the area where we can expect to find uh, archaeological deposits uh, that are older than 1537. And 1537 is the cutoff year for automatic protection, protection by, by law, the, the Cultural Heritage Act. Um, so medieval and older deposits can be found in this area here. Um, again, Brigham here. And this also shows the thickness of the <coughs> archaeological deposits. So you see that uh, although the World Heritage Site is fairly small in comparison to the, the whole area, um, this is where the deposits start to get very thick <coughs> lead. This is from five, the, the dark brown is five meters plus, um, and we get up to thicknesses of maybe eleven meters, all in all. So it shows that there's been a there's the original shoreline back here shows there's been a great. Uh, great amount of reclamation from, uh, from the sea, from the harbour. So going back to 1955, um, this is where 
the real archaeological investigation of, uh, of Brigham began. Um, the northern, the northern part of, of the settlement, the Brigham settlement, was destroyed by a major fire. Um, they tried to fight it from the, or they tried to, at least to, to keep these other buildings from uh, from being destroyed by fire by by wetting them with the fire boats. Um, fairly major fire that. Uh, laid waste a large area, um, maybe 5,000 square meters or so. Um, and this then was cleared away, and they began with uh, archaeological investigations, which to begin with they uh, reckoned would maybe last 18 months or so, and lasted from 1955 until 1979. Sort of on and off, but there was, uh, yeah, there were some some intervals in between, but uh, a long, a long excavation, a lot of work. This is uh, a plan showing some of the earliest settlement remains that were found during the excavation, and this is up at the back. Some of these remains here are preserved or exhibited in situ right at the back of the museum, Brigham's Museum, so not far from here. Um, this is uh, a small timber boxes um, filled with stones that were put down as a, as a key front. And boats could be drawn up on the, on the shore and loaded and unloaded directly in there. And then you have warehouses and dwellings behind. This is uh, from about 1150 and then destroyed in the fire in 1170, 1171, according to the historical sources. But the point here is that you have rows of, rows of buildings, separate buildings, but forming rows, uh, separated by small spaces, and then you have passageways running between two rows of buildings. And this is, <clears throat> this is the building pattern that has been preserved. You see the, uh, the buildings here, the building rows, uh, which consist of these separate buildings, but built end to end. And then you have these uh, passageways that serve, serve the, uh, the two buildings on either side. And this is what we call the tenement system, the, the double tenement system. Um, and the property boundaries have remained remarkably stable over the years. Uh, there's not much displacement in, in uh, how the buildings have, have been laid out, uh, despite the town being destroyed by, by fire again and again and again. Um, this shows you how, how extensive some of the key front structures were. These are major, uh, major building works uh, consisting of uh, boxes, you can call them, uh, rafts of timber, interlocking timber that were placed out in the, uh, out in the harbour basin when they were pushing forward, advancing. Um, so a lot of uh, a lot of timber went into not only rebuilding the buildings after each fire, but uh, as well building the, the new key front structures. And this is a a section which goes up along here. I think it is from from the excavation, showing how things advanced into the harbour gradually. They would they would prefabricate these, uh, these timber boxes and then send them out into the water and sink them with, uh, with stones and with an amazing amount of uh, uh, earth. They, 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 the advancing usually took place after each major fire that had laid the town waste. So they would take all the available refuse, all the available rubbish that they accumulated in the preceding period of occupation 
and dump it out in the harbour along with these uh, key front, uh, key structures um, to make new land, basically, because as time went by, for one thing, they, they needed new land for, for storage and for, for dwellings, and the, uh, the ships got bigger. They needed to, to get out into, into deeper water so that the ships could actually come in and, and dock. So this is a steady, a steady progression out into the harbour. The harbour is, is out here uh, over the centuries. And as I say, the, uh, the thicknesses start to get up to 8, 9, 10, even 11 metres. Uh, we've had 11 metres of deposits in, in one of the drillings that we've uh, done. Um, again, showing the uh, enormous amount of uh, deposits. Very much uh, um, or consisting very much of organic materials, um, humus, excrement, uh, wood chips, moss, uh, a lot of it's highly organic. Um, as I say, it's, it's the refuse rubbish from from household occupation, from timber working, all that kind of thing, and then as well the, uh, the structures themselves. That's the kind of material that uh, I'm talking about, with uh, mosses, with uh, bits of uh, bits of wood, wood, wood chips from from timber working. Um, really quite well preserved and um, it's it's this material that is of course most vulnerable to attack by microorganisms uh, and especially when it's exposed to to the air and to oxygen because oxygen is such a, a rip or such a such an efficient source of energy for uh, for oxidizing the material and for that, that's when the decay sets in and along with that, there are many finds such as this uh, leather sheath, le leather knife, knife sheath, um, of organic matter. So all these things here, it's an immense storehouse of archaeological, botanical, zoological information, um, which we risk losing if we do not take proper uh, precautions. To, uh, to ensure that the preservation continues. Um, this is the earliest depiction that we know of, at any rate, of Bergen from about 1570, showing the full extent and uh, the key front with the, the hoisting, hoisting cranes for loading and unloading. Um, Brigham was very much dominated by the, the Hanseatic League. They, that was their, one of their, Brigham was one of their four main overseas offices, along with London and uh, Bruges and Novgorod. So a very important hub for the, for the trading, especially fish from northern Norway, which uh, they supplied to the, the continent because of the, yeah, the Catholic Church's dietary restrictions on eating eating meat. So fish was a, a staple, and people joke saying that Bergen is built on fish. That's quite true. <laughs> uh, we find a lot of fish bones in the deposits as well. Um, but at, at this point, the, the Hanseatic League was uh, was fading. It was in decline. Um, but the actual the office, what they called the German office, that lasted from 1350 to 1754. Uh, it was finally disbanded in 1754. So there was a long, a long time, a long German presence in, in the town. Um, then we get up to 1702, and here we have a, a really major fire that occurred then. 
Um, and it's after this fire that the standing buildings uh, of the World Heritage Site, that they were erected. Um, and, uh, yeah, the buildings, the, there's quite a lot of the original material there. They're, they've, of course, been changed and built on and all the rest of it since 1702, but the timber foundations that they stand on um, are very often from that period there. Um, so now there's a process of growing building by building and uh, replacing the foundations and jacking up the, especially the front buildings, elevating them by 60, 70 centimeters so that uh, they will be able to um, adjust. If, if sea level rise occurs, then they'll be prepared for, for that. So that's a 30-year project that they're talking about there. Um, the southern part of the settlement, this, this one here of the original uh, tenement settlement, that was pulled down uh, in the early 1900s and replaced by stone buildings. And probably this would have been slated for, for removal later on as well. But uh, there were various factors that ensured that it actually survived. Uh, there was wars, there were depression, yeah. So um, luckily, it didn't get it didn't get torn down. But uh, yeah, most of the archaeology in this section was, was dug away without any real supervision. So anyway, there's there's been been quite a few threats to uh, the, to Bruggen's existence up or down through the up through the years. Uh, for example, there was an explosion in 1944 out in the in the harbour, an ammunition ship blew up, and uh, the shock wave just removed. Sorry, the shock wave removed all the uh, all the tiles, the roof tiles and removed some of the roofs as well. Um, but they built it again. Um, even as late as 1960, there were in fact uh, people out in the streets uh, marching in to protest uh, or to advocate the removal of the rest of Brooklyn. They wanted new buildings, they wanted uh, modern buildings. But uh, luckily, thanks to the efforts of uh, quite a few dedicated people, including the, the man who led the, the excavations, the major excavations there uh, in this part of, of Brigham, um, they were saved. And in 1979, Brigham was uh, inscribed in the UNESCO World Heritage List. And the important point is that uh, the, the site includes the, all the cultural layers, from the rooftops to the, to the natural, right? So all the cultural layers are, in fact, included. It's both buildings and, and deposits, uh, which is an important factor to ensure that they are looked after and safeguarded. Um, these columns here are from some of the drillings that we've undertaken and the various colors here denote uh, the uh, state of preservation of the, of the archaeological remains. So down, down here with the purple, it's excellent. It's as if, it's as if the material had been deposited there yesterday. Um, and then generally you find that yeah, there's acceptable, good preservation quite a, way, quite a ways up. And then it starts to get worse as we near the surface. <clears throat> and the next thing to occur was um, the building work, the uh, construction work for the hotel. So they put in a, a wall of sheet piling all around the uh, all around the site, right up to the the buildings here. That's this 
row over there. Sorry. And this is really where the uh, where the problems began for for the World Heritage Site because the uh, the hotel was a, a deep cellar, and they installed, of course, uh, pumps in the cellar to to keep it dry, groundwater pumps to keep it dry, and the the sheet piling is is not by any means uh, impermeable. It's not it's not tight. It's not uh, walled off. So. It's been these pumps have been drawing out the groundwater from from under, especially this northern part of northeastern part of uh, of Brooklyn, for a long time, and uh, it became clear after a while that these buildings were settling quite badly. Uh, the ground underneath them was actually decaying, uh, and there were settling rates measured of up to eight millimeters per year. So things had to be done, and uh, in 2011, the Norwegian government uh, allocated funds uh, to the tune of 45 million, million kroner to begin the, the work of uh, installing infiltration, uh, an infiltration system that would use all the, uh, the roof water, for example, from the neighboring buildings and from Bruggen itself, and channel it down into the ground to replenish the groundwater. And at the same time, there, were, there was work was done to, uh, to seal the sheet piling as much as possible. So it was, it was a, a major effort, um, lasting from 2011 to 2015. And uh, the results have been generally very good, uh, as long as we can keep the the water going in, or we've just had a, just recently had a very dry <laughs> period, and uh, it's it sh it shows when we look at the the data from the the various monitoring points. Um, yeah, so that's basically uh, what it is. It's uh, making sure that there's ensuring that there's enough water there to keep the deposits as wet as possible, saturated. Because uh, water is a lot better than no water. The the amount of oxygen in the air is something like uh, a thousand times. It can be up to a thousand times greater than the the amount of oxygen in, in water. So keeping uh, keeping things wet is uh, it shouldn't be a problem in Bergen. You know, people <laughs> always joke that uh, yeah, it rains a lot, but we we do actually get periods, prolonged periods of. Uh, of drought. Um, yeah, it seems to be near in the end, which is uh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>